Robert Jan Smith, thank you very much for taking the time for giving us this interview. You are the former Director General of EU's Directorate for Research and Innovation, so you shaped for quite a long time European research and innovation policy, and nowadays you moved to Technical University Eindhoven. Europe is proud of its fundamental values, for example, human rights, human dignity, freedom, democracy, and so on. At the same time, Europe is part of a global race for innovation. What role can European values play in this race for innovation? Is there a specific European approach to value-driven innovation? Well, I think that uh, the values, the European values we have, they are a prerequisite for long-term sustainable innovation. And as a matter of fact, uh, André, you already identified a number of these values. I would like to add another fundamental value, and that is cooperation and partnership. So our, say, our innovation model is based on the European values of freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, dignity, rights, and cooperation and partnership. I see also other models of innovation, more state-driven, top-down pushed innovation models. And I think they work on a short run, but in the long run, they often fail because they lack one important component, and that is cooperation and partnership based on a win-win situation. And that's why I'm convinced that our European model is the model which is the most sustainable and is the strongest in the long run. You mentioned cooperation, cooperation of which actors? Which are the actors that cooperate in the European model? I think the, the strength of our system is the cooperation between industry, academia, with the citizen, with society, with municipalities, but also cooperation with other parts of the world, but always based on a win-win situation. And that's why I make this comparison with the state-driven innovation model, which you see in certain continents, where very much there is not a cooperation based on win-win, there's cooperation based on win-win for only one partner. And that's why I say, I think that this model, a top-down state-owned driven model, not based on partnership and cooperation, but on a selfish attitude will in the long term not survive because they will completely isolate themselves. Is there a certain, you mentioned openness to the world. This has also been one of the big brands of the Horizon 2020 program, openness to the world. And you mentioned cooperation, but isn't there also a kind of competitiveness aspect in research and innovation? And how to deal with this tension between cooperation and competitiveness on a global scale? Well, that has always been, um, of course, the, 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 the question also for Horizon 2020, what is the balance between cooperation and competition? If I take the European Research Council, the ERC, that is fierce competition between the best brains, and then those who win are really top-notch researchers, they get the grants, and they are able to extend the frontiers of knowledge. In other fields, um, the cooperative research, the collaborative research uh, projects are very there, much there to work in partnership with other continents across the globe to find solutions for the grand societal challenges. And there you are in a partnership trying to use the best strength of each partner to find a solution for these grand societal challenges. So there's always been in European programs and in all innovation models a good, say, balance between competition on the one hand and cooperation on the other hand. Uh, you also mentioned society. What role does society, what role do citizens play in this cooperative way of innovating? Well, I think increasingly important that the citizen is a co-designer of the innovation uh, system, is a co-designer of the agenda, is a co-designer of the solutions which are necessary. So I think this, this co-designing is essential for a, a long-term sustainable innovation system. It's no longer anymore an issue of industry doing things or the university doing things. It is really an all-inclusive process whereby partners from the triple helix sit together, work together, think together, develop long-term uh, roadmaps uh, in order to get the innovation through. And uh, that is the model I see more and more emerging, especially here in the region of Eindhoven, which is quite uh, amazing. This is the fastest growing area in the Netherlands, uh, also one of the fastest growing in Europe, all high-tech companies. If you look at the annual turnover of the companies in the city of Eindhoven, around 72 billion, 
they invest an enormous amount of money in research. And we have one organization which brings the triple helix together, it's called Brainport, where municipalities, the province, um, citizens, companies and universities sit together to discuss the innovation agenda and work in partnership to implement this innovation agenda. And I think that's the strength of this region and of this model. Uh, within these partnerships, what roles do citizens play? Do they really have an impact on the agenda of uh, these innovation networks? Absolutely. I give you an example. We are at the moment in uh, part of the town here uh, building a complete new uh, series of houses. Um, uh, there will be uh, a few thousand houses built whereby together with the citizen, the ones who are going to own these houses, the university, the municipalities and the companies, we discuss how can we make this new part of town completely energy neutral? How can we use uh, eco innovation? How can we have uh, innovative transport systems there? How can we uh, be even a generator of electricity? So together with all the partners involved, we are developing this new part of town, these new houses, uh, and that's, I think, the strength of it, that everyone is involved in setting the agenda and developing the innovation plan. Your example sounds like a good example that a system is capable of designing itself. So yeah. how could we empower systems to understand that they are systems, to empower the individual company, the individual citizen or the individual policymaker in taking his or her role in this system? Unfortunately, normally it's always when there's a crisis that people come up with new models. And this happened the same in this region. Don't forget 10, 12 years ago, this region was in enormous problems. Philips was almost bankrupt and uh, Duff had serious problems, the car manufacturer. But then the different parties decided to sit together and to develop a common innovation strategy based on partnership, based on cooperation, based on common agenda setting. And that is where which led to the success of this region. Uh, so that's why I say, unfortunately, often it is a crisis which is necessary to let people think or to push people to think in a different way and to go more to a systems approach. We have been successful here and we are very eager to spread our say, best practice here to other parts of the world uh, and of Europe, of course, so people can learn from how we work together in partnership, how we work together with citizens, universities, companies, uh, local government in order to move things uh, forward. So I believe very much on this systems-based approach, a more holistic approach to innovation. And that's, I think, the model of the future. Does it need specialized systems facilitators or moderators or any kind of tools? Or is this systems-based approach just a question of bringing together the right people? No, it's, it's also a matter of governance. You need to have the appropriate, say, um, governance in place to allow these partners to meet and to also encourage these partners to meet. Um, and it's of course um, also here in the region, it was taking quite some time before these governance models were developed, where each partner has a role which is appropriate and where people meet each other. And that is, I think, uh, again, a prerequisite for this new systems-based innovation that you have appropriate governance models which allow the different parties to meet to sit around the table but also to responsabilize them and these meetings which we are having are not just meetings whereby one says the other does everyone has the agenda and everyone comes to the table to the meeting table with i can contribute this i'm willing to put this i can help here so it's not a request and a demand it is really you bring to the table something of which you know will be an asset for the whole team, for the whole group, for the whole triple helix. Did you experience certain moments where you also felt that there's a tension within this group where some important actors would run the risk of dropping out, where some conflicts emerged or some competitive competitive moments? Your example perfectly fits to the topic of our European project Living Innovation because it's about smart homes. And it's also about smart health. Uh, do you know if this case study you mentioned also touches upon issues of lifestyle, health and fitness? Or is it just about building infrastructure? Oh, no, no, no. It's all involved. It's, it's also about lifestyle. It's about uh, vitality. It's about health. It's about sustainable transport systems. Um, it, it, it involves the different, different components because also 
you want that people have a healthy life whereby the different actors all come together and i think that's the beauty so it's not just about the housing it's not just about uh, energy but it's also about food it's about uh, vitality it's about sports mm -hmm. it's about a healthy environment a green environment uh, um, nature-based solutions so it's really an all embracing approach what skills do researchers and innovators need to better consider responsibility aspects and to innovate on a systems level? Well, what we see very clearly in this triple helix and in this uh, role model we have here in Eindhoven, in the Brainport region as we call it, is that with the so-called hard skills, the technology skills, you get far, but you don't get far enough. You need more and more skills of creativity, teamwork, partnership, working together, co-design. And unfortunately, these skills are called soft skills. I would call them much more enabling skills. So we discovered here in the region that these enabling skills are crucial, are crucial for, as you put it already yourself, Andre, the more systems approach to innovation, where you do co-design with society, with citizens, with universities and, and companies. If you don't have these enabling skills, if you don't know how to partner, how to cooperate, how to co-design, you will not get there. How can these skills be trained? How can they be provided by university? How can they be trained by, let's say, human resource departments in companies? Well, our university here, uh, the Eindhoven University Technology, is a nice example, because we have increasingly what we call challenge-based learning. And where we put groups of students into a team and we give them either an assignment ourselves or they come up with an assignment themselves. For instance, one of them, a group of students is now building a car um, uh, fully empowered by solar um, uh, cells to participate in the solar race in Australia. Um, students have built the first electric motorcycle which ran around the world in 80 days. Uh, students here have had uh, a project in which they could build within one month a sustainable house, uh, um, which um, also participated in a competition in Dubai in the desert. Can you build in one month for a couple of weeks a house fully sustainable, uh, energy neutral? So bringing students in teams, letting them to challenge themselves or you challenge them is the best way forward. And that's why this challenge-based education is something in which we are going to invest big time, because I see that is helping the values of cooperation, because these are teams of students work together. This is helping you to, to, to work as a team, uh, to respect each other, uh, to get things done through co-design, and bring also different disciplines together. How could this approach be used by companies when opening innovation processes and trying to overcome innovation barriers? Well, I think that companies uh, um, um, are, of course, increasingly also embracing open innovation. And as you probably know, the company which sets the nicest example already a long time ago of open innovation was Philips here in the region. There used to be here a Philips high-tech campus. And something like 15 years ago, they decided to break down the world, to take away the word Philips and to call it just the high tech campus, to show the open innovation concept and to show the partnership and to show the open innovation dimension. So I think the companies also more and more are embracing open innovation. And certainly in this region, people see that that is the way of doing things in partnership so open innovation is here something which is fully embedded and there we have to give credit to a company like philips and rick hartwig who was the chief technology officer because he was the driver of this whole open innovation concept here already years ago openness has been the key narrative of commissioner moedas last years open in many aspects but what are elements where open is too open i heard a stand-up comedian say if your mind is too open your brain might fall out uh, perhaps if our innovation is too open our innovators our innovators might fall out so what has europe to protect in the global competition the fact that you're open does not mean that you are or should be naive you have to be realistic you can be open to its partners who have the same values like you have who really see cooperation as a win-win situation.
you have to be careful to partner and to be open to those countries, to those organizations who are not there for partnership, but just to take what you have. Um, and that is, I think, something which in Europe we realize more and more that uh, we should not be naive in cooperation. We should only be cooperating with those who have the same values and uh, um, with whom we have a real win-win situation. Mergers and acquisitions have been banned in several cases when there was a risk of a monopoly. Uh, now, what about key enabling technologies? Should Europe have a closer eye on key enabling technologies to avoid mergers or acquisitions of very important companies uh, and therefore trying to protect its unique proposition? Well, I know one thing. Where Europe unites and works together, we are unbeatable. Take CERN in Geneva for basic research, the field of energy. Take Airbus a European project where we join forces, we are unbeatable, we are the strongest in the world. And I've always said, why don't we not do that in other areas as well? But that requires also, I think, a serious review of the European competition policy. We all know the debate about the merger between Siemens and Alstom, uh, which was not allowed uh, for uh, competitiveness reasons, uh, competition policy. I think we need really to review the European competition policy. Uh, and to be, from that point of view, much more, perhaps, uh, daring, clear, when it comes down to key enabling technologies, areas where strategic assets, strategic strength of Europe are necessary by combining forces. Will this have also some effects on acquisitions by leading companies from companies outside Europe? For example, the robotics market has been sold out to companies from outside Europe. And it's quite similar when we talk about big data and artificial intelligence. There are no comparable big players in Europe comparable to Google or to Amazon. You've seen that uh, also from the side of the European Commission, there is now over the last years a policy developed that you have, which says, let's be very careful by allowing takeovers by non-European companies of our robotics firm. There was even in Germany a big debate because that was one of the origins of the, of the, of the whole discussion when there was a robotics company which was bought up by, I think, a Chinese company. Um, we have to be extremely careful that we protect our key enabling technologies, uh, like the artificial intelligence, the photonics. Uh, um, we just cannot afford to sell that out or to let that be sold out. Um, in the Netherlands, we had an interesting debate as well on the uh, um, shares, governmental shares of our telecommunication system. Uh, there was a Mexican investor called Mr. Slim. He wanted to buy up the Dutch uh, telecom company and uh, which is a key component of the Dutch strategic ICT infrastructure. And of course, Mr. Slim as an entrepreneur only had one idea, to cut it to pieces and to sell it then to other parties. Is that an interest of the Netherlands? Is that an interest to have a, uh, um, an entrepreneur from Mexico um, taking ownership of a key part of your uh, ICT infrastructure? with only one goal is to break it down, to split it up and to sell it in different pieces to make a lot of money. No. And therefore the government rightly said, no, we will not allow that. So I think there has been more common sense uh, increasingly last years for Europe to protect its key enabling technologies, its basic infrastructure, uh, uh, and not to sell out too quickly to third parties. Was this basically the interest of the Dutch government or the interest of Europe? What role did Europe play in this case? Or was it just the Dutch case? I think it's a, it's a general um, discussion we see in all European countries uh, taking place. Uh, so the Netherlands, which has normally been extremely open and liberal country, everything was possible here with regards to takeovers and mergers. I think also in the Netherlands, people have come to realize, have we not gone too far? with this globalization, with this uh, uh, um, um, free market approach where everything is possible. And uh, again, um, this is something now which I think more and more countries in Europe uh, come to think about. Huh? Uh, is it good that our ICT infrastructure is owned by foreign companies huh? or our utilities in the field of water or electricity? Is that something which, which we want? 
uh, is it good? Should we have a, should we have always a majority share or a golden share, as people call it, as government that you can still always be, you know, involved? So, I think it's only healthy that we think about these elements um, because it's not, how should I say, a, a fair world uh, where everyone applies the same rules and have the same moral standards. And increasingly, we say that is not the case. Eh? We live in a very rough world where you should only, uh, where you should not be naive and only work with those partners who have the same values as you have. Living at home will dramatically change. All the, uh, the experts that I talked to told me. Um, so our homes will really look different in 2030. But many of these experts don't have a clear vision how our homes will look like in 2030. What is your expectation? What is your vision? How will your home look like in 2030? And how will your life at home look like in 10, 15 years from now? Well, I, 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 I don't think that there will be that much revolution. People will still live in homes. People will still go to work here, of course, in the Netherlands on a bike very often. People will still go to restaurants to enjoy food, go to theater. So from that point of view, I think the life in 2030 will not change from that point of view. Um, just give an example. I moved here into a new apartment building, which just was constructed. Well, that will be still there in 2030. So I think that will not change. We will still live in homes. We will still go to work on a bicycle or a car. We will still go to restaurants or theater. What will change is, of course, how the whole infrastructure around us is changing. Uh, uh, my apartment will then not anymore be on natural gas, but it will get other sources of electricity. I will not go anymore if I use a car uh, by a, a, a car driven by combustion engine, but it will be probably an electric vehicle which I will use. There may be even automated driving involved when I uh, use this car. Perhaps I will share the car with all the people who live in the apartment building. So I think the infrastructure around us will change. We will have 5G, eh, which allows uh, also the whole uh, say wireless communication to go much quicker. So the infrastructure will change, but I'm convinced that in 2030, people still will live in homes, will still go to work, will still uh, uh, go to theater and go to restaurants, but it will just be a different infrastructure in which we will uh, operate. ICT experts say that Europe needs certain areas where it is a world leading, a world leader. Could smart health, but also be smart homes, be such an area for a unique proposition in, on a global scale for Europe? Well, in general, I would not be that skeptical or pessimistic about our continent. Uh, we have 7% of the world population in Europe, but we still deliver one third of the world knowledge. We have um, an amazing uh, um, uh, companies in the field of cars, trains, airplanes. We have first class pharma and food companies. So we have a highly educated labor force. We have top notch universities. So I'm very optimistic about our continent. Uh, the area where we have been missing out is the whole digitization or digitalization. Um, and now, as you all know, this digitization is even entering our sectors where we are so strong, the food area, the health area, the pharma area. And I think that is our biggest challenge to really catch up on the whole digital and big data agenda and to make sure that those sectors in which we have been traditionally strong and world leading are benefiting from digitization for big data. That will be the big challenge. Uh, so I don't think that uh, our situation as continent is that bad. I think we have a lot of assets, but we need to get our act together. And the growth markets will be smart housing, smart health, smart food, uh, smart transportation. And I think we have competences in all these areas. I talked to several experts of the ICT sector who told <laughs> me that scaling up is the biggest problem of startups in Europe. Uh, what could Europe do to help these companies scaling up? because otherwise they just move to the US because they have a much bigger market there and a much higher potential for scaling up. Well, that has been traditionally our problem. If you look at Skype, Invention Estonia, commercialized in the United States. If you look at Booking.com, Invention in the Netherlands, scaled up in the United States. So a lot of our startups did not have the possibility to grow 
because there was not the venture capital market uh, flourishing, money available to allow them to, to, to scale up. So they went very often to Silicon Valley, to the United States. As a matter of fact, I think only uh, almost 40% of the entrepreneurs, uh, the businessmen, the innovators, the startups in Silicon Valley, I think European origin. So um, we have an enormous potential in Europe and that's why it's so important that we help these companies, these startups to go through the so-called value of debt, uh, bring them into touch with uh, risk capital, uh, venture capital. And that's why I think this initiative of Commissioner Moidas, the European Innovation Council is really needed and is really something brilliant to allow these startups to go through the value of debt, to have access to capital, big capital, in order to uh, realize their dreams and not have the possibility and not have the, 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 the challenge that they can't do it in Europe. They have to go to the United States purely because there's a lot of cash to burn over there. Uh, so I hope that this European Innovation Council will very much, uh, very quickly be rolled out because that's exactly what everyone has been waiting for. Is it just a question of venture capital? Because then it, we wouldn't need a European uh, Innovation Council, we just need some venture capital banks. So what is it more than just money? No, it's, it, it, it's mentoring, of course, it's coaching, it's helping, it, it, it's um, uh, bringing these startups in contact with the right uh, innovation ecosystem. Um, it is also very often a matter of legislation uh, to allow these disruptive technologies to be rolled out and not first to regulate everything uh, and, 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 and stifle the technology to be rolled out, um, but to do things in a much more entrepreneurial and testing an innovative way. Uh, we in Europe have the tendency that before we allow a technology, a new technology brought out, that we first make legislation and re-regulation and then by the time then this technology uh, is supposed to be rolled out, it's, it's too late. Uh, while other continents are much more willing to allow new technologies, disruptive technologies to just be introduced. And then along the way, they introduce the regulation. So it also requires, I think, a different mindset in Europe on how we deal with regulation, how we deal uh, with our internal market. You mentioned uh, mission-driven research. So the missions are the new tool in Horizon Europe. Um, will these missions also allow for innovation on systems level and in what kind of way will they do? I think they, they will. Um, I think first of all the missions are a fantastic new tool of Horizon Europe. And they were recommended by this uh, high-level committee of uh, Pascal Ami, as you probably know. Why? To also bring innovation and science closer to society, to the citizen. And by having man of the moon type missions, uh, you can create excitement amongst the citizen and a citizen can feel part of such a project. So I think missions are a great idea. And the missions, of course, can only succeed through a systems approach. Uh, and the man of the moon is, of course, the most famous mission we all know, and it could only succeed through a mission, through a systems approach, whereby the electricity people, the materials people, the engine people, uh, even the health people got together because the astronauts had to, you know, uh, survive in the cockpit. Uh, so it was an all embracing systems approach to innovation and missions can only be successful if this systems approach to innovation will be applied. Uh, and that's why um, that will be, I think, the biggest challenge for all the missions is how to get the systems approach to innovation organized without setting up an enormous bureaucratic network, um, uh, complex governance structures, which are more talking than doing. So that is, I think, the biggest challenge for these missions is to define the mission, but also afterwards to have a structure in place which allows you to move forward and not to just be stifled by discussions which then not lead to anything being completed. Will there be a specific mechanism to involve citizens and or society into the missions? Well, I think first of all, the missions were already defined through a public consultation. And so that is already, I think, very nice that uh, the citizen were asked to come up with ideas for missions. And then on the basis of that, it was selected. So the co-designing has been taking place with citizens. I think also once we are talking about the implementation, citizens groups will be involved in the different activities. Eh? Uh, if you take um, one of the missions is about cancer, uh, early diagnostics, um, treatment, uh, of course, it's obvious that patient organizations are involved in that. Uh, uh, so 
This is again part of the systems approach, the all embracive approach, where you involve the citizen and the representative organization, like patient organizations or consumer organizations, in the missions you are developing. Thank you very much for taking the time. My pleasure, André. Thank you.